And now, from an undisclosed location in San Diego, California, I bring you Wheelock Part 2, the second half of Wheelock's Latin at a Glance. One of the things that's always a little frustrating about teaching Latin, not frustrating, but discouraged, you know, it's discouraged, no, it's depressing, I don't know what it is. Anyway, is that you, you spend a whole semester and you don't get even halfway through Wheelock. So I typically get to chapter 17 or 18 in Wheelock uh, in a first semester of Latin. And then, of course, there's a, there's a set of students that don't take the second semester, or sometimes because of the vicissitudes of life, uh, a second semester isn't even offered. And so in this video, I would like to give you a whirlwind tour of the second half of Wheelock, chapters 18 through 40. <clears throat> now, uh, I personally uh, had high school Latin and then jumped right into a master's in classical languages. I had a little Greek, so that was some, somewhat justified. Uh, but let's just say that I hadn't done any Latin since high school. But I was able to, because I kind of knew a little bit about Greek, I was able to do Wheelock on my own. And I also believe that, um, uh, you know, that the typical student that takes Latin can actually go through Wheelock and do pretty well if, if they're disciplined enough. Uh, and, of course, there's always somebody around at some university to give a little help. So this is a whirlwind tour of Wheelock Part 2. And for those of you who are doing this for my class, uh, there is, of course, a word hidden in these uh, videos that if you will email me that particular word, I will give you participation credit uh, for this particular class in which I'm in San Diego. It's awful here, you know, in Indiana. I don't know what the temperature is. It's just, let me just say it's horrible. I won't tell you the temperature here, but it's, it's just, it's an awful thing to have to be in San Diego right before Thanksgiving. Well, without further ado, <clears throat> Wheelock's Latin, part two, at a glance. So let's start with chapter 18. Chapter 18 gives us the beginnings of the passive, and chapter 19 will as well. What is the passive? Well, believe it or not, for the first 17 chapters of Wheelock, everything has been active. I praise, I, I warn, I hear, I lead. It's all been active. A passive, as you may know from uh, English torture in the past, is where the subject is acted on by the verb. So I am praised. Uh, would be the passive version of that. Believe it or not, we've gone through 17 chapters of Wheelock and we haven't had a single passive, uh, you know, where I am hit by the ball or something along that line. Well, uh, the, the problem is, of course, and this is a pain, is we have a whole new set of endings. So just to get them on the board here, um, here's how it looks. The, the active, you'll remember, is O-S-T-M-U-S-T-I-S-N-T. Well, now we're going to have an R uh, for the I-M, uh, ris for second person singular, tour, unter for the plural. I mean, the tour and the unter I remember because it has a T and an NT, kind of like the active. It just adds er. I mean, maybe you think er, I have to learn the passive. Uh, there are a lot of ers in the passive endings. I don't know if that'll help you. Mer is like mus, except with an er. Um, and then, of course, the second persons aren't as common in reading, but, um, you know, y'all is a mini. Uh, I'm sure you can come up with something. But this is a whirlwind tour. I can't take the time to pause. Uh, they, you also learn the, pe the present passive infinitive in this chapter. Basically, you take the normal infinitive, and instead of an E at the end, you put a long I at the end. So instead of laudare, to praise, you put a, a, a long I, laudare, to be praised, to be warned. Well, time, time forbids me to spend too much time. So you could go do chapter 18 that way. The perfect passive, um, you know, we've got to have a passive for the um, for the perfect as well as the present. So if the present is I am praised, the perfect is to have been praised, um, and so forth. Here we're going to learn about that fourth principle part. We've been seeing it in vocabulary since chapter one. We knew laudo is present, laudares, the infinitive, we learned that laudawi is the perfect I have praised. And now we're going to learn that fourth principle part, laudatum. Um, of course, the, the tum, 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 you know, the, the tum is the neuter form. Uh, it actually can be um, masculine, feminine, or neuter. Uh, and it can be singular or plural. Basically, unfortunately, uh, or maybe fortunately, you already know these endings, uh, the fourth principle part can take all the, the gamut of adjective endings masculine, feminine, and neuter, uh, nominative, plural, nominative, accusative, uh, dative, and so forth. 
uh, it's going to be important to know the nominative most of the time, but it basically means having been praised. So a man having been praised would be weir laudatus, a woman puella or a girl puella uh, laudata, um, something neuter laudatum, having been uh, praised. Um, so here is the, you can actually make it, uh, if, that's the perfect passive participle, the having been praised. If you want to make it into I have been praised or you have been praised, this is a little complicated, I'm sorry, uh, but it, it's going to take two words. Well, I mean, don't complain, look in English. Uh, to say I have been, I have been praised takes four words in English, it only takes two in Greek. Now, laudatus sum, I have been praised. Laudatus est, uh, you have been praised. Now, if I say laudatus, laudatus sum is right for me because I'm a guy. Laudatus. If you were a girl saying this, you would say laudata sum. Um, if you were a tree saying this, actually, I'm not, I don't remember, is it arbor? Uh, that's masculine. Anyways, take some neuter word. Um, uh, good grief, Ken. Leisure having been praised. Otium. Uh, leisure has been praised. Otium laudatum uh, est. Anyway, the third person is the most important to know. I can't let myself get distracted. This is just an overview. So, uh, we also learned in chapter 19 how to ask a question. You know the relative pronoun, who. How do you ask a question? Who is it? Uh, quis est. Quis is the interrogative, and then quid would be the um, uh, neuter one. Quid quid est, what is it, uh, and so forth. Okay, um, I've got to move on. This is just an overview. Chapter 20, and with this chapter we'll be halfway through Wheelock. Uh, there are five declensions. Remember, on a, on a day a long time ago, they got all the Latin nouns together, and they divided them into four groups. The first group were the first conjugation. They were mostly women with a few transvestites. And then the second declension, we got all the masculines together and the neuter minority, um, and they were the second. The third declension was very fun. Most of the fun words, uh, virtue, uh, you know, those things, um, uh, desire, cupiditas, you know, the fun verbs were all third declension. And then there were a few kind of, you know, the people that get picked last. Uh, oh, fine, we'll put them in the fourth and fifth. I mean, uh, so... The fourth declension are U.S. Um, it's not a very common uh, declension. You know, if you had to pick, uh, you know, who, who am I taking on the ark, uh, you can leave the fourth declension behind if you want. Uh, but, f so for example, fructus. Um, and it, it's um, it's not entirely foreign. Uh, foreign sorry. Um, fructui, for example, for a dative, we've seen a, a long I for the dative. Um, for an accusative, we've seen that. Um, having a vowel with a long mark over it for the ablative, well, we had a long A in the first uh, declension, we had a, a long O in the second, we had a short little E, but we're used to having kind of a vowel hanging out there for the ablative singular. So fructu, it just, it fits, it feels like it, it, the universe is in sync and harmony. Um, we're used to having a long vowel with an S in the plural, the third declension has a long E, S in the plural. Um, we're used to an um, uh, in the genitive plural, in the third declension, we're used to ibis. Uh, ibis is a nice dative and ablative plural. We know that. So if you can remember that fructus is the nominative and then with a long u is the genitive, why am I spending all this time? This is just an overview. Um, the fourth declension, ladies and gentlemen, is in chapter 20. Um, they also uh, occasionally scattered throughout these last chapters. He has some summaries of these sorts of things, too. The ablatives that have prepositions are fine. Uh, it's the ablatives that don't have prepositions that require a little extra brain brain space. The ablative of time when, you know, at that time, and the at jumps out of the at, you know, like Athena from Zeus's head, the at in at that time jumps from the ablative ending. Um, some of those uh, uh, ablative of means, by means of a stick, uh, those, those don't, you have to come up with the by means of or the at, um, well, here's another one that you have to just have to come up with it. The habit of a separation. Sometimes you can use uh, the from in from fear can jump out of the the habit of ending of the word for fear, and that's in chapter 20. We're now halfway through Wheelock, ha! Uh, but there are still 20 more slides to go. Sorry. Um, what about the passive of the third and fourth conjugation? Um, now here's the problem. Um, 
Well, it's not a big problem. Uh, basically, Wheelock is telling you that the same peculiarity that the third and, four, uh, third and fourth conjugation have in the future tense of the um, active, they're going to have that with the passive. So you're going to get that A and E uh, in the future passive. Um, so I will praise is, is future. I will be praised is future passive. Um, so I will lead is agam. Remember A and E in the third uh, conjugation. Um, and so we're going to get A and E's in the in the passive as well. So um, a, a gamer, A G E M U R, is going to be the first person plural. We will be led. Um, basically, A's and E's are still the channels of the futures um, in, in the passive as well. Uh, we get the present passive infinitive uh, for the third and fourth conjugation. So again, it's the same thing. You just take the infinitive uh, and put an I on it. What's different is is the third. Remember the wimpy third conjugation that that doesn't seem to have the you know it, it pretends to be to look a little bit like a fourth conjugation, but or uh, it or and it looks a little with that e like a second conjugation, but but it it's wimpy. Um, the things go away, and so the the instead of taking the infinitive agare and putting an i at the end agari, it just chops the whole infinitive off. It's just agi. Uh, to be led or copy to be seized. Anyway, read chapter 21. There's, it's a pretty short chapter, isn't it? Too bad we won't get to it. It would have been easy. Um, the fifth declension. Now, I actually... Um, the fifth declension, there are two words in the fifth declension that are significant. So we're going to leave the fourth declension behind when we get on the ark. But we have room for these two verbs, especially the word for thing. Um, uh, the word... And, and if you're an American... If you're a true American, you're going to like the fifth declension because the word republic comes from race publica, the public thing. We're doing that public thing in America. Uh, and so um, race is a word uh, worth learning. And, of course, the other important fifth declension word is dies, uh, which is also conjugated there, or uh, declined there in chapter 22. So we're going to take race and dies. Uh, we might leave the other fifth declension uh, nouns behind when we get on the ark. Uh, but uh, we'll take race, because race is important. Of course, um, it's not that hard, really. Uh, race, once you know race as the word, uh, then you've got the nominative uh, singular, you've got the nominative plural, you've got the accusative plural. Bus, uh, Rebus McIntyre, or Reba McIntyre's brother, um, is the ablative and uh, dative uh, plural. Rerum, um, uh, Lucretius wrote a, a, a cosmological treatise, uh, The Nature of Things, Natura rerum, I think. Uh, rerum naturae, I can't remember. Um, uh, I'm, I'm a horrible person. Why am I teaching Latin? But anyway, the U-M is fairly familiar for the genitive plural. Um, re, um, again, I'm used to seeing a long I in the dative of the third conjugation, and I'm used to seeing a long I in the genitive of the, first, uh, of the second conjugation. So there are kind of familiar forms. Again, I'm used to seeing a long vowel, uh, in the ablative singular, life is good. You may know the expression de re, sometimes used in philosophy. From the thing, it's intrinsic to it. Uh, it's part of its essential uh, identity. It's de re, it's from the thing itself. Um, these, this just an important word uh, in the history of, of Latin's usage in philosophy and culture. So I, I think you should, you know, it's worth, worth learning this one. Um, there's a nice little summary, by the way, of ablatives with and without prepositions uh, in chapter 22. I always, once I get into the later chapters of Wheelock, uh, find myself looking back to try to find that chart. It's in chapter 22. Um, chapter 23, yay, we're, we're moving on up. Uh, participles, ing words. For those of you who know Greek, um, you might think, oh no, it's the participle, because Greek is a participle-loving language, and participles strike fear into the heart of all Greek students. But participles in Latin really aren't that bad. Uh, it's, uh, it is declined, uh, so it's laudans, praising, laudantis, uh, but it's declined like a third declension um, uh, noun, and it's, it's not really that hard. I've never found, I don't know why, I've, uh, just there's not as much complexity to Latin participles. So laudans means praising, agains means leading, um, and then it will decline like a third declension 
uh, noun. It's, it's really not that hard. Uh, Latin doesn't love participles as much as Greek, uh, and so uh, this, I, I, it's, if you're expecting it to be uh, a horrible thing, participles in Latin just aren't. Okay, ablative absolute. Uh, you may know from Greek, Greek has an ablative absolute. Uh, Latin has an, uh, well, Greek has a genitive absolute, sorry. Uh, Latin has an ablative absolute. An ablative absolute construction comes into play when you don't have a case to put a noun or a verb in. So take the sentence, the moon blew up. That's a fine sentence. It's got a subject. It's got a verb. Yay. Um, what if you want to say that something was happening on Earth when the moon blew up that's completely unrelated grammatically? So, uh, I, yeah, I saw Ken, and then the moon blew up. Well, how are you going to... You could, of course, say, I saw Ken, and the moon blew up. But you can also do this construction, Ken having been seen, the moon blew up. Um, Latin had to pick a, a case to put Ken and... Uh, the participle in, and so uh, the Greeks got together and they chose the genitive to do this, and the the the, the Romans said, well, we're not going to be like the Greeks. I'm completely making this up, of course. Um, and they said, well, we're going to do the ablative. So, ken wiso, keno wiso, uh, ken having been seen, where wiso is the passive participle, uh, the fourth principal part, as it were, of um, widio. You know, maybe the reason why participles aren't hard for me in Latin is because they they have some different forms to where you learn them in little bits and pieces rather than having it all dumped on you. I don't know. I don't know what it is, but I just don't find Latin participles as, as uh, complex as Greek. Ken having been seen. And it's an ablative. Who knew? Um, the gerundive. Uh, not the genundive. That's, that's just not right. It should be gerundive with an R. The gerundive in Latin... Uh, is uh, has that nd see delenda uh, this helped me by the way with with spanish uh, for whatever reason because uh, spanish does an nd uh, kind of thing too um, for its normal participle non nadan nad, uh, nadando swimming something like that anyway um, maybe maybe that's confusing forget i said that um, but like delenda est there's a sense of necessity with the gerund gerundive in um, latin so the lenda s Carthago, uh, Carthago uh, is a um, uh, expression, a motto for the Third uh, Punic War. Carthage must be destroyed. Um, we've, we're sick of going to war with Carthage. We're going to destroy that puppy. Uh, so the lenda est, uh, you know est as it is, and then um, the lenda means going to be destroyed. Basically, it's a perfect participle. Going to be destroyed, but but it always had a sense of necessity. Uh, Carthage must be destroyed. Again, I, I, I don't know why I'm going into such detail, because this is just an overview of the rest of, of Wheelock. Um, but when you put the word, when you put the word est, um, the gerundive is just the lenda, or demonstrandum. When you put the word est on it, it becomes that gerundive, uh, or it becomes the passive paraphrastic of of necessity, so you might know from from um, uh, uh, geometry, QED, quod erat demonstrandum. Uh, that's a that's a gerundive and a a paraphrastic passive paraphrastic construction. Paraphrastic is where you put a to be verb along with a participle, like I am walking, I am talking. That's a paraphrastic. So passive paraphrastic is what this is called. So uh, demonstrandum est means it must be demonstrated. Or literally, it is to be demonstrated, it, or it is going to be demonstrated. But idiomatically, the way that's translated in Latin is it must be uh, demonstrated. Um, again, you don't need to know all this. Um, the the passive paraphrastic instruction uh, often took a dative. Uh, so the femina omnibus laudanda est is the woman uh, by all uh, must be praised. Uh, Laudanda est is literally it is going to be praised, but um, that idiom means it it must be praised, and the it here is a woman, so the woman must be praised, and then omnibus is grammatically unconstrued as a dative by by all people. Again, you don't have to understand this. You know, first semester is over. This is just what you would have learned in a second semester. 
And the first letter, for those of you in my class uh, who are doing this to get participation credit for a day when I'm in San Diego, the first letter of our hidden word is a P. Okay. All right. Let's move on. Chapter 25, just 16 more chapters, and we'll be done with this puppy. Infinitives. Uh, infinitives, we've already had some infinitives. You already know some of this stuff. So laudare is to praise. Laudari is to be praised. Uh, laudare we've had since chapter 1. Laudare I just mentioned a couple slides ago. Uh, there are, is also a perfect infinitive. So lauda, laudawise is to have praised. And laudatus esse is to have been praised. So this is the perfect active and the perfect passive uh, uh, infinitive. Esse, you know, is an infinitive of to be. Uh, and isse kind of looks like it, although I don't know that that really helps you. Moving right along. Now there's a future, um, a future infinitive. And I would say that if you're running low on brain space, you know, you're running out of gas, turn off the air conditioner and don't memorize this form. But uh, so if, if laudandus is the the future passive participle going to be uh, praised, then the active future active participle is urus uh, laudaturus. You take that fourth principle part and put urus on it, and you have the future active participle going to praise. I know that doesn't make sense that you would take the fourth principle part, which is a passive participle and make the future active participle off of it. I'm sorry. Maybe I shouldn't have even said that. Um, it's confusing. The way I remember this, uh, actually, I don't know how I remember it. I just, uh, I have history. But um, uh, the, the fourth principle part of sum, to be, is futurus. And that's just a happy coincidence, or maybe not a coincidence. But anyway, futurus sounds like future. And so the urus... Um, that might help you remember the future, laudaturus, the futurus. That might help you remember that that's the, the future active participle. But hey, this isn't the real course. This is just an overview. So laudaturus, turus esse, esse would be going to be praising. Um, and then uh, uh, laudatum iri is very, very rare. I don't even know. Surely I've translated a sentence with eerie. It would be eerie to see a sentence with eerie in it. But that's um, the future passive, going to be uh, praised. Um, man, we got to get out of this chapter. It's just just, just too nuts. Um, indirect statement is where um, it's, not, it's not a quote. Like uh, the quote would be, the teacher says, Julie is a good student. Um, but if you wanted to do it indirectly, the teacher says, that Julia is a good student. Um, that's that's an indirect statement, and you can do that in in Latin and Greek with with a infinitive. The teacher says Julia to be good student. Um, think of it as uh, an old Western movie. But anyway, you use an, uh, Latin will sometimes use an infinitive uh, to make that kind of a statement. Chapter twenty five, fifteen left. A comparison of adjectives. Uh, you know, more, better, best, uh, so long, longer, longest, uh, that's English, by the way. Uh, in Latin, it looks like this, longus, longior, longissimus. Um, if you've ever had piano lessons, you, you know, the, the Latin has, has gone into the uh, Italian, you know, so fortissime, um, most strongly, uh, strong, very strongly. Um, so longus is long, longior is longer, and longissimus is longest or very, very long. Um, and if you've taken some music lessons, that isimus might be somewhere in your subconscious as a as a um, superlative. Um, by the way, those of you who, um, well, okay, irregular comparisons. What I was going to say is in this chapter, there are always irregulars in any language. Sometimes these are the most common. Some of the most basic words in a language are often irregular. That's because um, they 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 go back to the earliest stages of a of a language's development back back when you had probably different dialects mixing in together. And so, um, so the the uh, the most basic parts of a language are often the most irregular. 
uh, because historically they are the most primitive parts of the language. Um, so um, uh, some of them aren't too hard. So like Facilis, uh, easy. Facilior um, is easier, and Facilimus uh, is easiest. Instead of Isimus, it's Ilimus. Uh, because of th- when you have an adjective that has an L or an R, a lot of times it'll just go with that. So uh, Facilimus or Difficilior, uh, Difficilimus, uh, uh, um, difficil- I think. So just be aware that sometimes um, words with L's like that uh, do it that way. Difficilior, by the way, um, if you've done textual uh, criticism of the of the New Testament, uh, one of the rules is to choose the more difficult reading, uh, the um, lectio uh, difficilior, the more difficult reading. Um, anyway, okay. Um, here's an irregular bonus, which means good, melior, better, optimus, best. You can see how this you know good is is a basic part to a language. And it's it's irregular. Uh, so there's irregular stuff in chapter 27. The subjunctive uh, in 28 we hit the subjunctive. This would be an important chapter if you're if you're going to be selective about what to learn in the rest of Wheelock. Uh, this would be a place to uh, to camp out a little bit. The other things are filling in holes and gaps, but the subjunctive is very important. Uh, the subjunctive is used in these uh, in languages to express things like purposes in in order that as an important uh, kind of expression in any language. And here we are, it's not till 28 that we get it. But um, the, the conjunction ut is used to express purpose, so in order that. Ut, that one little two-letter word means in order that. Um, it can mean some other things too, but let's go with in order that. And it uses a subjunctive verb. Or you can say in order, in order that not, um, uh, in order that I might not relinquish my duties in teaching this class, I have made this video. In order that not, you would use nay uh, with the subjunctive. Uh, what does it look like? Well, okay, some more kinds of subjunctives. So you can make a command. Let me think. Let him leave. Let us go now to Thessalonica. Um, those sorts of um, subjunctive first-person plurals or subjunctive uh, first-person singular, um, you, can, you can make a justive a command by putting a verb in the subjunctive. Uh, mood. What does it look like? Well, basically, in the first conjugation, all the A's go to E's. So, laudem means, uh, we might have ut laudam, in order that I might praise, or ut laudes, in order that you might praise. All the other conjugations go to A. So, they switch places with their vowels. The first conjugation with the A goes to an E, and all the other conjugations with their letters go to an A. Uh, so, manaam uh, ut manaam, in order that I might warn, uh, agam, ut agam, in order that I might lead. Um, you may know the old expression, uh, credo et ut intelligam, uh, I believe in order that I might understand. Stand. Intelligam is a uh, subjunctive there, uh, a, where intelligere, a third conjugation verb with an e, becomes an a, intelligam, in the subjunctive. Okay, so chapter 28, important chapter. Um, chapter 29, uh, uh, it's about this point of the text that, that you begin to go crazy. Now, maybe you've already gone crazy um, even before we got to chapter 18. Uh, but it, it gets a little crazy, a little hairy uh, as we get into uh, these later chapters. So uh, we're be- we begin to get into something called uh, verb sequencing, uh, tense sequencing. Uh, there are there are what are called primary tenses and there are what are called secondary tenses. Primary tenses are are non-past tenses like the present or the future. Secondary tenses are past uh, tenses. So in in this kind of verb sequencing, tense sequencing, when the main verb is in a past tense and you're going to use a subjunctive, uh, then um, if the main verb is in the present tense, uh, you're going to use a subjunctive in a in a uh, a primary tense. But if the main verb is in a secondary tense, a past tense, then you're going to have to use a different kind of verb. Uh, now, by the way, what this sentence is not the whole story. Um, what I just told you gets at the next story. And in chapter 30, we're going to get the whole story. But, but so if you're not going to get a present subjunctive 
if the main verb uh, is a past tense. Um, so basically, um, if I said, um, he came in order that he might see me, he came is past tense. So in order that he might see is going to be an imperfect subjunctive. Past tense in the main verb, secondary uh, tense in the subjunctive. Okay? Again, you don't have to know this. This is just what you would have gotten if you'd have taken the second semester. Um, basically, what does an imperfect subjunctive look like? It's basically the infinitive with a verb ending. So you take laudare and put an M on it. I might. Um, he came in order that he might praise me. In order that, or I came in order that I might praise him. Um, I came, um, Waney, uh, in order that, but I might praise laudarem him, uh, eh, eh, or whatever. Um, so basically, take an infinitive, put put a verb ending on it. I put au, au, audire mur, that's the passive, first person plural passive, we, um, we might be heard. It might would be possible translation of that. Um, we also get, uh, so uh, this is, again, this is a little hairy, and um, of course you're not even taking the second semester, probably, if you're watching this. Um, so don't, don't freak out. Um, this, this is doable. It would have been, you, this is understandable. It might have taken a little time, but, you know, you would have understood this, or you will, if you go on and do it on your own, or if you go ahead and take a second semester. Maybe we're trying to decide. I hope I'm not discouraging someone out there from taking a second semester of Latin. Um, so purpose clause is expressed in order that. A result clause is, is so that. So uh, I came in order that I might get this degree. Um, uh, he tripped with the result that he fell. You see the difference? Purpose is looks at it from the standpoint of before and toward after. Result looks toward what happened after. But purpose tends to look at it from the standpoint of before. Result tends to look at it from the standpoint of after. They're closely related. Um, result clauses, clauses often have signal words that clue you in to the fact that it's a result clause. He was, uh, he was so big uh, that he fit around the house. Um, no, so kind of triggers the idea of, of result. Um, and there's some other little features there that I'm going to ignore uh, for the sake of not uh, completely blowing all the fuses. Okay, um, chapter 30 is where we really get the whole picture of this verb sequencing, of how primary tenses um, in the main verb have to have primary tenses in a, in a subjunctive clause. And uh, similarly, uh, secondary tenses in the main verb have to have secondary tenses in, in the subjunctive clause. And he finishes out the, the different forms of the subjunctive in chapter 30. So this is what I've said, primary tense followed by a primary tense, secondary tense followed by a secondary tense. So for example, the present or future main verb, those are primary tenses, will lead to a present or perfect verb in the subjunctive. If you want to, um, so you're going to use a present subjunctive if you're going to have it at the same time as the main verb. If you want the subjunctive clause to be past tense with remain to the main verb, then you have to use uh, the perfect. Again, if you don't understand this, don't don't worry. In fact, I'm just going to keep keep flipping through here. Um, if you have a past tense, then you're going to have an imperfect or a pluperfect in the subjunctive verb. You're going to have a perfect if you want it at the same time as the main verb, pluperfect if you want it to have happened before the main verb. Again, don't worry about this. What do they look like? The perfect form adds ERI um, in between the stem and the ending. And then the pluperfect adds ISA between the stem and the ending uh, in this subjunctive. Again, uh, you would have had this over the course of a, you would have had all these subjunctives over the course of several weeks, and it would have been fine. It, would, you, it, wouldn't, have been, it wouldn't have been bad. It would have been okay. We'd have gotten through it. We'd have held hands. We'd have, um, you know, had some um, a stiff root beer, and we'd have gotten through it. Um, but anyway, um, chapter 30. Uh, this is probably, you know, in my mind, maybe one of the one of the more challenging features of Latin. But it's not it's it's not as bad as participles in, in Greek even then. Okay, indirect questions uh, is is covered in this chapter. 
Um, he asked what I was doing. Uh, indirect question. Okay, cum clauses. These are fun. Um, so we've al you can already have uh, cum in a clause is uh, is not something you buy at the store. Uh, you know, something in a can, Prince Albert in a can. It's not cum in a clause. Uh, but um, we've had cum with nouns. You know, he did it with vigor. Um, he graduated magna cum laude. Um, that sort of thing. Uh, peace be with you. Uh, wobiscum. Uh, pax wobiscum. Um, that's cum in a na with a noun. Cum in a clause is when you might say, for example, when you see him, tell him I loved his paper. Um, that would be a, a temporal clause, um, and, and you, you would use the indicative uh, for that. Uh, but you can use cum with a subjunctive, which is why we're getting it so late in Wheelock, in the last ten chapters, the home stretch, the final lap of the mile. Uh, so circumstantial cum clauses. Uh, when he did this, um, I freaked out uh, under the circumstances of him doing this. It's going to use a subjunctive. Uh, you can, there's also a causal cum clause. Since, I mean, don't freak out that you can translate cum by different words, um, like when, uh, but since uh, is a possible translation. Since he knew this, uh, he avoided downtown. That's a causal clause. Concessive clauses. Although he knew this, he still went downtown. Um, those are all potential translations of cum with a verb, um, and the context will tell you which one to use. Um, Chapter 31 gives us the fun, irregular verb, pharaoh, I bear, a conifer, bears cones. Um, pharaoh, pharaoh, oh, that's something different. Anyway, uh, this is fun because it has to be one of the most irregular uh, verbs. Look at the perfect tuli, or the uh, perfect participle, latum. Um, it's just fun, a little extra memory, and it means I bear. And for those of you watching it, for my class, we get the second letter. I'm not going to tell you what the first one was because I want you to have watched the video up till now or at least uh, done some sleuthing to find the first letter. But the second letter, I shouldn't even tell you it's the second letter. The second letter of our hidden word to get participation credit is the letter A. Okay, let's move on. Uh, chapter 32 has some uh, more irregular words but are very important. Um, have you ever been uh, taken to court um, and not wanted to admit your guilt, uh, but also not wanting to say you're innocent for whatever reason? Maybe you don't want it going on your record as having admitted, uh, but uh, maybe you just want to, I just want to pay the fine and be done with this. Then you can plead nolo contendere, which means I do not want to contest uh, the charges, even though I'm not admitting guilt. Nolo means I do not want. Wolo means I want. No lo, I don't want. I mean, that's easy, right? Wolo, molo. No lo is basically known wolo combined together. Why Why say known wolo when you can say no lo? Also, um, isn't that a candy somewhere? Anyway, malo is uh, I, I prefer, uh, I want more. Um, oh, anyway, so here are three words. There's some irregular forms with malo and no lo. You can read the chapter. There are places where um, it splits apart like... Uh, I think the third person singular of nolo is it breaks apart into known wolt. Um, <coughs> wolo is a little, a little weird. Uh, it goes into um, a u sometimes, like the third person singular is wolt, v u l t. Who knew? Uh, just more more memory to waste. Um, also in this chapter are adverbs. So remember long, longer, longest. Uh, the long e tends to be an adverb ending. Uh, forte with no, strongly, uh, longe, longly, that's not a word, um, far, I guess is um, what that would mean, longius, uh, far, uh, more far, far, uh, more distant, anyway, longissime, the long, in the longest, for the longest time, uh, however, ly is kind of an adverb ending in English, if you remember the pains of high school, uh, so anyway, the comparison of adverbs uh, as well as the very simple adverbs is in chapter 32 as well. I think that's pretty much it. There is a there is a dumodo word um, that is um, uh, uh, as long as something like that, and it uses the subjunctive. It's basically a vocabulary word. Dumodo um, uh, uh, as long as something uh, happens, it's going to take a subjunctive. It's a proviso clause. I think there's a 
philosophy um, a philosophy uh, uh, logical term I'm sorry I need to have more Starbucks uh, but we only have eight uh, chapters left to go conditions um, if uh, conditions are if then clauses and the word for if in Latin is C S I uh, so uh, uh, use the indicative to make if then clauses when you're talking about simple facts uh, you know if you are the son of God then you're pretty important you know that would be a simple a simple kind of fact however the reason why we're getting this so late in Wheelock is because there are subjunctive conditions like if you want to say if I were a rich man la da 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 you know that's a contrary to fact because I'm clearly not a rich man um, you can do that in the present tense you can do that in the past tense um, uh, another one subjunctive you can do uh, is to use the present subjunctive um, uh, this is the should would um, uh, if I am if I am a teacher um, I am teaching I don't know uh, but, but basically that's not good if I would if I would teach I would I would no I don't know I, I'm failing you but basically the the um, the present subjunctive is used to express something uh, in the future uh, that uh, is less vivid meaning it's not as likely and none of the examples I was coming up with were uh, were of that sort of uh, that kind uh, if I if I would fly I would enjoy the sky maybe that's a little bit more uh, down the line of what it is. It's, it's, if you use the present subjunctive in both the if and the then part, you're saying something that's not at all likely uh, to happen. Sorry, I flubbed that, but I'm not going to record re-record this video just because I flubbed up the future less vivid. Uh, go read chapter 33. You've got the book. Um, chapter 34. Um, basically, this is about pretenders, deponent verbs. These are verbs that look passive, but they're actually active. They're, they look like. Uh, passive sheep, but they're really wolves disguised in sheep's clothing. Um, there's nothing, no, no great meaning here. It's just that there are some verbs that want to look passive. They're passive-aggressive. Uh, so like hortor, um, I urge, fatior, I confess, sequor, uh, I follow, patior, I suffer. Um, you've heard of a non sequitur. That literally means it does not follow. But notice it sounds active. It doesn't follow. Um, it looks passive, though. It has a passive ending. Um, who knew? For whatever reason, there are certain verbs. They're just, they're weird. They look passive, even though they translate active. Nothing to see here. Um, there are also some verbs uh, that, um, like an ablative, this is something that we're going to see also in chapter 35, that certain verbs desire their, their uh, objects normally the object of a verb would be in the accusative but there are some verbs be, that by their nature they want some other um, uh, tense to, or case to follow them and so there are some verbs that like their objects to be in the ablative case rather than the accusative case um, and and so there are some verbs that want a dative in chapter 35 there are some adjectives that want a dative so like in the phrase it is similar to sleep Obviously, the adjective similar want in English wants a to, similar to something. And so the word similar in Latin will use a dative with it, similar to something. Um, and there, there are also verbs that want a, a dative, verbs of trust, believe, command, obey, pardon, spare, serve, please, harm, persuade, marry. And uh, there was a long list that, unfortunately, I don't think I ever fully got down. But these are the kinds of verbs in Latin uh, that really want their object to be dative uh, rather than uh, accusative. And that's in chapter 35. Chapter 36, we're very close now. Five more chapters and we're done with Wheelock. Uh, there are uh, just of noun clauses. Uh, these are kind of indirect uh, commands. And again, they, they, they deal with, with specific kinds of construction. So he commands that you come. He persuades that there is a God. He warned them that they would die. He urged them that they would have trouble, um, that they would have trouble, that they would die, that they should believe. Those are noun clauses. 
Um, and a noun clause is basically where the whole clause functions grammatically like a noun. Uh, he said that he was coming to the house. You know, that he was coming to the house is a noun clause. It's all of that whole clause is the object of he said, he said what? He said that he was going to the house. It's like he hit what? He hit the ball. He said that he was coming to the house. All of the, that whole clause functions like one word as, a, uh, as an object. And so these are noun clauses. They go with certain lead verbs. That you, you, you know you're going to get a certain kind of pitch with these verbs. I'm, I'm, um, the San Diego Padres are right, you know, the stadium is just right down the street from me. Um, I don't know uh, whether there are certain pitchers that always throw certain curveballs, but the verbs like command, persuade, always, uh, when you're, when you're going to have a content with it, you're going to get one of these, these just of noun clauses. It's going to be a noun clause that in some way has a sense of duty with it or obligation uh, that, that fits with that idea of adjustive that's a command. Um, and, and here's the clincher. The verb's going to be subjunctive uh, in those, those clauses. Chapter 36. Um, I, I don't remember why I have ut with a subjunctive here because ut, uh, we've seen ut in purpose clauses already. Um, so... Uh, I'm not remembering what in chapter 36. Uh, maybe he gives you, maybe he gives you the summary of ut uh, and how it's used. Uh, in um, ut can be used with the indicative in some uh, cases. Uh, I'm sorry, my memory's failing me. And I, my book is way over there, uh, so I'm just going to tell you that there's something relating to ut with the subjunctive in chapter 36. Be sure and see it because I'm sure it's just complete, totally rad. Okay, uh, chapter 37 uh, deals with the very important verb to go. Um, if you've seen the Monty Python Life of Brian skit where he does Romans go home, uh, the verb form go, the command is ite. That's an irregular form of eo, which means I go. Um, the verb to go is often regular, it seems, in, in Indo-European languages. Uh, so chapter 37, just under the wire, uh, just in the last four chapters, he's going to give you um, this verb to go. Uh, chapter 37 also has a summary of place constructions. So we've already learned these along the way. It's kind of like he's, he's, he's systematizing things for you now. Uh, he is, he's, I love Wheelock. Wheelock is my favorite uh, language introduction book of all time. Um, he has inductively you know, introduced you to these constructions throughout, and now as the book ends, he's going to pull it all together. So the dative is generally used if you want to say a specific place, at this place. If you want to talk about going somewhere, then the accusative is probably going to be used. And then if you want to talk about place from which, then probably the um, uh, ablative is going to uh, be used. And he summarizes that. Very exciting. Uh, in chapter 37, we get the locative case, uh, 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 an appendage, uh, a survival, an artifact of the Indo-European parent language. Um, Sanskrit has a locative, but the locative has, has completely gone away in Greek, and it only survives for this one form uh, in Latin. And here we get it in chapter 37, the only locative, locative sorry, that has survived in Latin from our Indo-European parents. Um, and uh, this is the genitive form domi. It means at home, location. Um, believe it or not, in Sanskrit, there's a, there's a distinct case uh, there's an eight case system uh, in in Sanskrit, uh, which of course is is very dead. Uh, but um, uh, so the the locative at home is the genitive construction domi um, of the of the uh, the noun domus. Um, and again, in Life of Brian, it's funny um, this uh, skit in Monty Python Monty Python's Life of Brian uh, has all of these grammatical features that you don't get into the final chapters of. Uh, of Wheelock, and because I'm uh, a weird person, I find that really uh, ironic for some reason. But uh, so he says, Romans go home. Romani, nominative plural. Oh, no, no, I'm sorry, it's vocative plural. Romani, vocative plural, go home. Uh, ite, the imperative of eo, and then uh, domum uh, is the. Um, um, it's actually not locative, is it? So Monty Python's wrong. But anyway, to to home, to your home. You don't have to have an odd with domum. You don't have to have, have odd domum uh, in Latin. You can just say domum, go home. Okay, 
Um, and then uh, uh, he slips in another little little thing here. If you want to say, uh, you know, I I taught Latin for two years, you would put the phrase two or the words two years in the accusative case to express express duration of time. Same thing in Greek, uh, the accusative of extent of time. Uh, so chapter thirty-seven has some little. Uh, he's slipping in some important things right before uh, the, the clock expires. And is it the final letter? I won't tell you whether the final letter, we've had uh, several letters so far. I won't tell you how many. Um, here's a letter X. Is it the final letter of our word? Uh, we'll find out. Uh, we'll have to watch the last three slides to find out if, if the word has ended. Okay, chapter 38. Relative clauses of characteristic. Um, this is a you know you know normal relative clauses. I am the one who is talking. That's a normal one. There there are however some relative clauses of characteristic. Uh, these deal with a type of person or a general kind of of situation. These there are people who would love this video, or who is there who would not love this video, or there's no one who would love this video. You're talking here about a type of person rather than a specific person. Uh, I am the one who is doing this video. That's a relative clause that's normal. It has an indicative verb. But if you want to say in general, well, there are people who would love this video. That's a relative clause of characteristic, and it's going to use a subjunctive verb. Um, again, what are you what are you worried about? You're not taking the second semester right now. Uh, you'll have a whole semester. You know, in fact, uh, uh, some classes don't even get through Wheelock in two semesters. I might even be talking to people in a third semester of Latin now. Um, dative of reference uh, is a funny one. Uh, like if I, uh, Basically, the dative of reference is where mihi, uh, the dative of me, is used like IMO in, in uh, uh, text speak, in my opinion. Mihi, to me, uh, in my opinion, you know, or tibi, to you, in your opinion, uh, dative of reference, with reference to me, you wouldn't say that. Well, uh, the the conclusion of this matter, in reference to me, is that, I mean, you wouldn't say that. You would say, in my opinion. But uh, the dative of reference, which you can get the concept by translating the dative with the words with reference to in front of the dative. You're allowed to do that. You're allowed to pull out of a, watch me pull out, with reference to, out of a hat. You know, you're allowed to do that uh, with the dative case. Um, and chapter 38 talks a little bit about that. There are, uh, oh, the supine. How could I forget the supine? Uh, how can you get through Latin without the supine? Um, the supine is basically, um, if you take the fourth principal part and you treat it like a fourth declension noun. Remember fructus a few minutes ago? So maybe we do need to bring the fourth declension on the arc. I don't know, just so that we can have the the supine. It would certainly be mirabili visu, mirabili dictu, um, if we could get everything in Latin on the arc. Um, this is an expression. Mirabile uh, dictu means wonderful to see. I mean, sorry, mirabili dictu means wonderful to say. Mirabile, mirabile visu means wonderful to see. Um, and that to say, one, uh, mi wonderful, mirabile dictu, to say, um, in the saying, by in in saying, wonderful in saying, wonderful in seeing. We wouldn't say that in English, um, but that's the supine is basically um, the fourth principal part treated uh, with a um, like a fourth declension noun in the ablative. You can also do it, I believe, in the accusative um, and express kind of I came uh, foreseeing. Um, you could you could do that with the accusative uh, dictum. Um, uh, Okay, well, the supine is one of those little, uh, yes, I, I really know Latin. Okay, you had one semester of Latin, I know the supine. I'm a real Latin person. Uh, but it's in chapter 38. Two more chapters and we're done. Uh, it, it, this really, you know, you really, uh, the, these last few chapters are challenging, I found. Maybe, maybe it's because it's the end of the second semester. But they're also very rewarding. feels like some of the meatiest, some of the meatiest constructions in Latin are in these these last few uh, chapters. The ones that really uh, feel, you I mean, there's a real sense of accomplishment, I think, when you get some of these. Uh, so uh, we've already talked about the gerundive, which has a passive sense, quoterat demonstrandum, what was to be demonstrated, 
or uh, literally it's what was going to be demonstrated. But remember the idiom of the passive paraphrastic in a slide I just gave you. What was what must what was to be destroyed, uh, de demonstrated. What I had to what I had to demonstrate. This is kind of a cocky way to end a proof uh, in geometry to put QED. Uh, what had to be demonstrated, I have demonstrated. Um, QED. It's obvious to anyone with a brain that I've shown you exactly. Um, and, I, and of course, we always use a British accent when we want to um, uh, talk about someone being snooty or evil. Okay. Um, now, the gerund uh, is um, is an ing word used as a noun. Um, so, uh, walking is fun. Walking is a gerund in English. Latin did not use the nominative to do a gerund, uh, so it only has there are only three forms, uh, or, or maybe four four forms. Sorry, for the gerund in Latin, there's the genitive, the dative, the accusative, and the ablative. Um, but so, for example, the art of living well, ars vivendi, um, the art of living. Um, I, I, uh, there are actually companies that call themselves this sort of thing, ars vivendi, the art of living. It's usually very artsy people who are interested far more in the quality of life uh, than the quantity of, of life. Um, there is some crazy stuff in this chapter. Again, there's some stuff in these latter chapters that I do find a little bit difficult, um, but it's doable. We can do it. You can do it. Uh, so, for example, um, Latin didn't like to say um, I got smart by reading books. Uh, they didn't like to say by reading books. What they wanted to do is they wanted to put books um, in whatever case reading would have been in and then use the um, uh, the passive participle. Um, so by books being read. Why would they do this? Um, but again, uh, if you do actually finish Wheelock, uh, you'll, you'll catch on to it with a little... Uh, you know, several hundred hours of practice. Uh, okay, um, so there, that's that's one of the craziest things in Latin to me. It's an idiomatic thing. This that they, they didn't want to say by reading books. They would put books in whatever case you know reading was going to be in, and then use this passive participle. But here's the good news: we've arrived at chapter forty, the last chapter of Wheelock. And once you understand this, you pretty much had all of Latin. Wheelock is good about covering all all of Latin. It's not like you now need to take an intermediate course where you're going to get, you know, a whole bunch of other stuff. If you have got everything through chapter 40, you pretty much have Latin, and it's just time to start translating some stuff. Of course, you've been translating all along uh, real things. That's the, the great thing about Wheelock. Um, he reviews questions in chapter 40. Now, good news is you've already had some of this, so you know that putting ne at the end of a, uh, the first verb of a word, putting a verb first and putting net on it introduces a question. You already know that. You've known that for ages. Um, you may or may not have noticed uh, in the vocabulary, well, you haven't because you haven't done the rest of the book, but the, the word none introduces a question, ex question expecting a yes answer. And the word num introduces a question expecting a no answer. Well, we don't do this very well in English. Uh, th you, we can do the question expecting a uh, a no answer. You can say he didn't call, did he? Uh, that's a that's a question expecting a no answer. It's harder for us. Um, um, I guess you could say he's going to come, isn't he? Uh, that's a that's a question expecting a yes answer. Uh, but anyway, Latin and Greek uh, did this with with constructions, and chapter forty slips it in uh, right before the wire. Finally, fear clauses. Again, the stuff in these last chapters is a little. Um, it takes a little doing. So, for example, I fear that I'm going to be done with this video soon. Um, I get that. That's that's easy to understand. But but um, what what Latin does is it flips it flips what you would expect in English with regard to uh, yes and no. So, if you want to say I fear uh, that this time is coming to an end, you you put the word nay for not. I fear that it is not coming to an end. It's almost like you're saying, I fear that it is not coming to an end in order to say, I fear that it's coming to an end. If you want to say, I fear that it's not coming to an end, then you have to say something like, I fear that it's coming to an end. It flips exactly, uh, it flips it the way you would expect it. 
But that's chapter 40. And if you're at the end of your first semester, chapter 40 of Wheelock is a long way away. But I just wanted to give it, uh, you a sense of what the rest... I mean, I believe it or not, if you had everything memorized that I've just said, um, you would really pretty much know Latin. Um, I've, I've been able in... I don't know what the time clock is. I hope it's less than a half an hour. But I have in maybe a half an hour covered the entirety of the rest of Wheelock and and most everything in it. Um, I haven't done all the forms, but I've really given you pretty much the rest of the book. So have at it. Go take that second semester or uh, start doing a page a day of Wheelock. You know, just start taking baths instead of showers and read one page of Wheelock in the bath a day until you're done. Well, this has been Ken Shank. Uh, my dad pronounced it differently. Uh, bringing to you the rest of Wheelock. I hope you have a, a wonderful Latin life. May you learn the Ars Vivendi. Bene.